Guests of honor, Mr. Tan Chan Chun Singh, Minister of Education, Mr. Lito Comacho, Chair of UAS Board of Trustees, Mr. Peter Sia, Chair of LaSalle Board, Ms. Lo Sin Ling, Chair of NAFA Board, members of our UAS LaSalle and NAFA Boards, Professor Steve Dixon, President at LaSalle, Ms. Tan Wai Lan, President NAFA, distinguished guests, colleagues, and fellow teachers, students. I'm indeed privileged to greet you this way. Fellow teachers, fellow students. Fellow teachers, in choosing our vocation, we have inevitably become permanent students. And our students have constantly made us better teachers better learners. And it is especially in a university, a college, an institution of higher learning, that we aspire to fulfill the highest ideals of a special learning community. All of us learning from all sources, from each other, from our students, from our peers across disciplines, institutions, and regions of the world from those who have come before us and with an abiding concern for those who come after us. I also wish to acknowledge fellow educators in our midst, our administrative and support colleagues, and our partners too, from the arts community, academia, civil society, government, and industry. For without you, as our co-educators, we cannot carry out our educational mission. This also means that we bring out the best in ourselves and in each other when we are guided by, when we live out an ethos of collegiality and mutual respect. And when we extend this ethos beyond our university, reaching out to the public, the wider population, and the world. And this precisely is the trust of my speech. Just as no artistic or intellectual endeavor can germinate and flourish in a social vacuum, cut off from life, no university can grow and thrive in a self-enclosed domain, cut off from society and the world, from its living roots. This applies to each of us as persons and professionals. None of us can achieve anything substantial or sustainable alone, contrary to the celebration of the solitary genius or the myth of the great leader. There are indeed mysteries to human creativity. And yes, individuality and solitude may be preconditions for originality. But community and solidarity transform creative labor and channel it towards public purpose. And even more so today, as we grapple with the new challenges of the contemporary world that is described by the acronym VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Behind these words are lived experiences of ordinary women and men facing extraordinary personal circumstances that are shaped by larger social forces, which they feel are beyond their control. We have witnessed this most dramatically in the COVID-19 pandemic, which exposed and worsened inequalities. During the most devastating phases of the pandemic, we also saw 
the governments of so-called developed nations faltering, failing, and failing in their basic duties to their peoples. How do we map the contours of our time? How do we chart the paths ahead? We face the multiple crises simultaneously, pandemics, climate change, technological disruption, social inequality, and political polarization. And we need to understand their cumulative impact on the way that we live and work. As educators, we ask, what does it mean to be educated? What does it mean to be an educated person with our students in mind, economic growth, and social equity are among our chief concerns. And hence, job skills, occupational preparedness, professional growth, and career progression are on the top of our minds. Over a lifetime, however, our graduates also seek, shape, and sustain a vocation, finding personal meaning and social purpose in their creative work. This is why I think the word vocation, vocational, as in vocational training or vocational skills, has a more profound and original meaning that we now tend to accord it, narrowly confining it to learning a trade or being qualified for gainful employment in an occupation, getting a job, entering a profession, and building a career. These are crucial issues which no one should discount, especially those who have not or not yet experienced what it means to be unable to make a living. Let us remember that we do not educate our students to just enable them to get their first job, which will be the first of many jobs. Upon graduation, they would have many decades of adulthood ahead of them. The decades ahead will be filled with unexpected challenges and unforeseen circumstances. Let us together think through education and arts education in our time. At this inaugural symposium, we offer a gesture of appreciation to our arts educators, exemplified by some of our senior teachers gathered here today. And our first duty has been to remember the founders of our two constituent colleges, Mr. Lim Hak Tai and Brother Joseph McNally. For it is important to acknowledge that our university has not emerged out of nowhere. Many artists, many teachers, many artist teachers and practitioner educators have over generations made this moment possible. There is much to say and remains to be written about Mr. Lim Hak Tai and Brother Joseph, two exceptional individuals who led remarkable lives and whose creativity, foresight and determination were buttressed by a deep sense of vocation. Mr. Lim's vocation can be traced to the ideals of the May 4th movement of 1919, Wu Shi And Brother Joseph found his religious calling in his teenage years. And his wider vocation later naturally extended to the combined spheres of education and the arts. 
I hope it may suffice here to draw upon Tang Da Wu's 2017 exhibition at NAFA entitled Hak Tai's Bow and Brother's Pool and Our Children, which attests to Da Wu's profound regard for each of the founders and their legacies. And Da Wu is himself an artist teacher who has been teaching for more than two decades at the National Institute of Education. Tawu could not be here today. We want to register our appreciation for his role as an arts educator and also, more concretely, his three exhibitions and rounds of seminars on art and arts education in 2017, 2019, and 2022. At the risk of simplifying what is a complex and multi-layered exhibition, let me just highlight the suggestiveness of Tawu's title. Here, the six horses are a reference to Mr. Lim Hak Tai's six principles, enunciated in 1955, outlining aspirations for the art of the post or the pre-independence era leading to independence whose spirit I will indirectly revisit today. Haktai's personal name, Xue Ta, connotes wide and great learning. And the huge bow is a play on the Chinese term for an archery bow, gong, which has the same pronunciation as the term for merit and contribution. When combined with Haktai's name, Xue Ta, this suggests that his merit and contribution is great. And of course, the college that Lin Xue Ta built is going to be part of a Ta Xue. Here, and I hope this is not too literal, Brothers Pool refers to the pool of artistic talents that are gathered in the art college that he founded, with rocks and broken glass perhaps alluding to the obstacles and challenges that artists confront, as well as the constant need for self-reflection. And there are many stories of how Brother Joseph had to face many obstacles, especially in securing financial and official support for his dream of building a school. Indeed, we cannot speak of the arts without speaking of artists and their lives. Let me turn to just a few illustrative examples out of many that can be drawn from the entire range of the arts in Singapore and Southeast Asia. Artists, Sapati Kami, Merasa Kenyang dengan Melukis. Rohani Ismail was the first Malay female graduate of NAFA. And Georgia Chen was her teacher, Zhang Liying. This is a fascinating case study of the bonds forged between teacher and student who became close friends. Reading their many letters, written in Bahasa Melayu, a language that Georgia Chen learned and used diligently, we can't help but feel the sense of mutual affection and care between them. In one letter, Rohani Ismail signs off, Yang Tidak Lupa, the one who does not forget. This was a friendship based on deep social memories. And here, let us not forget the lessons that we can draw from their experiences. I will just make three observations. First, Rohani identified herself and her teacher as fellow artists who experienced the feeling of fullness, kenyang, and one might say, fulfillment in art making. 
This fullness is bodily, emotional, and social. Second, their friendship is an example of intersecting biographies and histories. Two artists, one established and one as aspiring, from contrasting backgrounds meeting in Singapore, our corner of Southeast Asia, and in an art school created by Chinese emigre art, uh, artists. Georgette Chen said that she was the product of two Chinese revolutions, 1911 and 1949, and the First and Second World Wars. And she spent a significant part of her formative years in Europe before making her home first in Penang and then in Singapore, which led her to learn and speak, to speak and write Malay. Third, there's a material difference between them. Georgette Chen was close to three decades older than Rohani. She was an established artist by the time she taught at NAFA. In 1960, when she painted Rohani's portrait, Rohani was barely 20 years old. Malay artists were coming together to form a community in a more organized way. And Rohani was a co-founder of the Angkatan Pelukis Aneka Daya, or the Association of Artists of Various Resources, whose leaders are also with us today. And their motto was, Sachita Manchipta, together we create. Indeed, artists everywhere have always had varied resources. In 1975, both women artists exhibited at an International Women's Year show. When interviewed, Georgia Chen said, that she breathes and eats and sleeps art. But Rohani expressed frustration and disappointment that she could not make a living from painting and that art has become a hobby and that marriage for a woman meant leaving one's talent behind. Thus, the personal circumstances and the social conditions that artists especially aspiring artists, labor under, are not something that we can take for granted. And behind the question of livelihood, deep down, there is a process of personal searching and struggling, which many of our teachers can appreciate. And there is, in Rohani's case, a gender dimension to the process. In this connection, I would like to highlight or point to the concept of merantau that in part explains the fertile imagination in Latif Mulhidin's art making and its rootedness in Southeast Asian landscapes. And I've learned much from Mr. T.K. Sabapati, Kanaga, on this concept of Marantau, which, as you can read, one has to leave home, one has to venture, one has to cross bodies of water. And in this case, in the Minangkabau tradition, which is Latifs, it's a male preserve, enabling setting aside or freeing from impending household obligations and setting out into the beyond, unencumbered in all ways. Indeed, it may well be rare for aspiring artists to be unencumbered in all ways. And so much depends on the struggle between the inner self and external social conditions. I pause here to share a lesson I learned from my friends from the Centre for Singapore Tamil Culture. Tamil is one of the oldest languages in the world. Around 2,000 years ago, classical Tamil literature, 
especially Sangam poetry, the word Sangam, referring to the academies of the time, was very well developed. The poems continue to be read, or continue to be read, and performed today, and even in translation, they can touch us deeply, especially the genre called Akam love poems, which speak to the inner life as contrasted with Puram poems, which are about the exterior world, for example, about war, heroism, and king kingdom. There appears to be a universal distinction, inner and outer, which is also reflected in the Islamic concepts of batin, inner, inward, hidden, and sakhir, external, manifest, physical, bodily, which is a common part of the Hari Raya Adifitri greetings among Muslims. And the lesson here is that no artist, just like any other human being, each of us have had or have to cultivate our inner lives and to grapple with external circumstances over the course of a lifetime. The idea of a university. Narrowly defined, a university is a degree-granting institution. And we know that the degree is prized as evidence of achievement at the apex of the educational ladder. And the university is a vehicle for social mobility. Today, we still welcome cohorts of first-generation university entrants. But what of their parents and relatives who never attended university? Many of our parents never when even to high school. We often come across people in our daily lives who, when asked about their education, say with a tinge of regret that they never had the chance to study at higher levels for reasons that have to do with lack of opportunities and having to support their families from a young age. And often you would hear this phrase, but I did go to the university of life. And in Chinese, 社会大学, the university of social experience. Friends, it is a great privilege to be a member of a university as a student or a staff. And this must carry with it a sense of responsibility on our part to think and see beyond ourselves. On this note, I would like now to take a step back and reflect on the idea of a university. It is not accidental that the term university carries with it two associated ideas, universe and universality. This suggests to me that a university as an institution of learning embraces learning about all aspects of the universe and that a university's mission is predicated on an ideal of the universality of humankind. On the first point, we must be in awe of the vastness of the universe, which has been described by Nobel Prize physicist Frank Wilczek as follows. Earth is one of several planets of our sun. Our sun is among billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is one of billions in the visible universe and it is an expanding universe, whose, which recently the James Webb Space Telescope has enabled us to appreciate its beauty 
as never before. This is a real picture. It was not generated by AI. At the beginning of his book, a beautiful question. Will Check poses these questions. Does the, un does the world embody beautiful ideas? A scientist is asking this question. Is the world, is the world a work of art? And at the end of the book, he offers his answer, which is a resounding yes. But he goes on to say that the physical world is both beautiful and not beautiful. The physical world embodies beauty. The physical world is home to squalor, suffering and strife. And in neither aspect should we forget the two. This leads us to the second point about the universality of humankind as an ideal. If the physical world is home to squalor, suffering and strife, and if, as we know, the impact of these conditions are unevenly distributed within and across populations, what is there to be said about a sense of shared humanity among all peoples, and even more so today, with extreme social inequality and political polarization. And the plurality of contending worldviews and values. Yet in the face of such a world, fragmented, fractured, a university is perhaps the one institution that holds on to the idea that in its pursuit of understanding all aspects of the universe, the possibility of a shared humanity on an increasingly fragile earth, a mere speck in the universe, is still an ideal worth striving for. And if this is the case, where do the arts and arts education figure within the context of a university. There is by now a vast literature on the very definition of art or the arts. As one Thai artist, Tang Chang, suggested in 1971, the question, what is art, is intrinsically related to the question, what does it mean to be human? As he puts it, when we separate the materials, techniques, and narratives, something should be left behind. For him, what is left behind is the essence of being human, which he equates with human intelligence, and which we might broaden to encompass human sentience. Art-making draws from a full range of our human senses, exercising the qualities of human sentience and creativity. And arts education develops these qualities as capabilities that can be expressed across many art forms and arts disciplines. Yet, Tang Chang insists, do not tell me, he says, that the craftsman is an artist or that his work is a work of art. Do not tell me that the technique, the colour, the narrative, and other invented things are art. But this view seems to negate the idea that these tangible things are the products of human intelligence, human sentience. Put simply, there appears to be two intertwined dimensions of the arts. On the one hand, the arts is part of material life and the making of objects, including everyday utilitarian objects that are invested with symbolic meanings, not just by the makers, but also by their users. 
especially in the process of making special in communal life. On the other hand, art is a medium of human self-reflection. Making art, as Tang Tao Wu likes to say, involves making questions. This latter view has sometimes led to the distinction between art and craft. Although it must be argued that the two cannot be clinically separated, as if the processes of making involving materials and technique and thinking involving ideas and concepts are two disconnected processes. One way to understand the critique of craft by artists, or some artists, is that they are responding to a situation in which traditional craftsmanship has reached a stage where experimentation and innovation have been stifled, especially when it has been sponsored by the establishment. And it's out of sync with contemporary social conditions that engender new and pressing questions. Here we turn to the reflections of another Thai artist, Montien Bunma, in a letter to his wife, Num, in 1987. As you can read, he had this preoccupation with the time that he was living in and asked, what are the values of this age? What are its characteristics? And of course, in a country like Thailand, there are many ideas about the national character, the Thai culture and tradition. But this, arti this artist asks, what about contemporary world society? We need to find a way to bring both in, in the creation of works that represent the time that we live in. Here we see an artist struggling with discerning the new demands on artistic work and yet laboring under the shadow of established ideas and practices. I almost cried when I read this. Noom, when I get back to Chiang Mai, he was writing from Paris where he was studying. And of course, overseas education at a time when local institutions like the UAS that were not yet in place. Many good things happen when our students venture abroad to Paris, to London, to New York to study. And it does things to the mind. And he says, when I get back to Chiang Mai, I will no longer use wood sculptures at all. Why? And you can read, we don't have enough Thai teak left to be sculpting away. We should be changing our old way of thinking. And if we want to use wood, we should use what today is called sustainable wood. The government is promoting reforestation, but the artists take the trees and chisel at them. This is one of the instances, I was about to say few instances, but one of the instances that the government is right and the artist is wrong. Mm. Noom, I'm telling you, a piece of art on a mountain with no trees has less value than a single bean sprout. This is a powerful expression of critical, self-critical environmental consciousness on the part of an artist and long before it became fashionable. I'm going to fast forward because many of us are thinking about curricula and pedagogies. And I'd just like to choose the field of design and design education of which some colleagues in this room, together with colleagues from industry and other universities, have contributed to the report on design education by the Design Education Advisory Committee. I will now want to connect what Montien Buma was questioning, his line of questioning, with some of the thinking about design education 
and the pedagogical implications of complex contemporary social issues, as found in the report. This is adapted from the report. To use Montem Puma's reference to wood sculptures, we cannot remain at the user level thinking about producing wood sculptures for those who commission it. We have to consider the economy. And as you can see, the scale, the scope, the complexity is changing when we broaden our radar screen. We have to consider society and culture, a larger scale. And we have to consider environmental degradation and climate change. And we have to think about how we offer an education to our students, both in the diploma programs and in the degree programs. And as we move from low complexity to high complexity, we are also having to think about what does it mean to have disciplinary specialization and what are its limits as we move to consider the economy, society and culture, and environment. And finally, on the need for transdisciplinary approaches in dealing with the complex challenges of our time. Let me turn briefly to talk about a technological development with profound implications for us, generative AI. There have been significant developments over just recent months. And the range of responses can be from, on the one end, paralyzing fear, and on the other hand, uncritical embrace. With a few prompts, we can scour, the, our machines can scour large volumes of data to generate text, images, music in a matter of seconds. And if what is generated is not quite what we want, all it takes is some tweaking of the prompts to generate something slightly different. This raises several questions, important questions for the arts. I think I will not belabor these questions because many of these questions are in your minds and they may not carry the same weight depending on the discipline and the art form that you are most intensely involved with. What I can say is that the quest to do the most expedient and to get the quickest answers or image or text is achieving, in achieving expediency, do we lose something in the process and do we still call it a product of artistic creation? And how, as us educators, can we teach our students to use new tools without replacing the need to grapple with difficult questions and make judgments concerning artistic merit and social, cultural, and environmental impacts. The question of art making in the age of artificial intelligence deserves our detailed attention in the years ahead. Just as nearly a century ago, social thinkers have had to consider the work of art in the age of technological reproducibility with the advent of photography and film. But this time, the issues raised include larger philosophical and ethical questions about human sentience in addition to the impact on art making and pedagogy. I now turn to Singapore's location in Southeast Asia and the world. For today's purpose, my reflections come from two inspiring sources, and I will not be able to do justice to the richness of these works and to their fuller 
implications. I'm inspired first by Professor Wang Gangwu's recent Institute of Policy Studies, his series of lectures on living with civilizations. And second, by the recent publication of The Modern in Southeast Asia, a reader edited by Kanaga Sabapati and Patrick Flores, both of whom are here today. Indeed, a very significant compendium of writings on artistic and cultural developments in the region, translated from vernacular and other languages. This work runs into something like 1,300 pages, and it took some eight years to come to fruition under the auspices of the National Gallery of Singapore and in, in partnership with NTU's Centre for Contemporary Art. Prof Wang sees civilizations as stemming from, I quote, efforts by visionaries, prophets and teachers to explain the universe and find the meaning of life on earth. From a set of first principles, ideational and moral principles were constructed to uplift the life of everyone above local cultures and identities. In this sense, civilizations are borderless, whereas local and national cultures are located within boundaries, in the latter case, within the boundaries of the nation state. And Southeast Asia is at the crossroads of East and South Asia, has been a confluence of four major civilizations, the Indic, the Scenic, Islamic, and modern European civilizations. Singapore can be said to have been heavily influenced by modern European civilization as part of its history as a colonial port city. But Singaporeans too must learn to live with the civilizational legacies that they have inherited, however imperfectly. This has a special urgency in light of global and regional geopolitics. In some ways, complementing Prof Wang's work, the edited volume of writings by Southeast Asians on Southeast Asia art shows the struggles that these nations have had in their paths to the modern world involving traumatic developments including periods of great violence, even genocide, to which artists have responded in different ways, as seen in the example of Montien Bunma's uh, reflections that I referred to earlier. It might be said that Singapore, for reasons related to its colonial past and its path towards independence, sudden independence, and with its strategies of globalization, with the world as its hinterland, it might be said that we have tended to leapfrog the region. But the two works that I've mentioned indeed point to the need to engage with our neighboring countries in deeper ways. And I'm very proud to say that NAFA and LaSalle faculty and students have been creatively finding new ways to connect with the region culturally, artistically, and intellectually, and through the region with the world. But this also means that Singaporeans themselves must have a deeper understanding of our nation's multicultural history. Here, I want to draw some insights from one particular cultural organization, the Centre for Singapore Tamil Culture, 
I would like to highlight some parts of its mission statement for our consideration. Tamils, of course, have had a long history in the maritime exchanges of the region and in Southeast Asia. However, our Tamil friends are asking, despite their distinct identity in name, are Tamil Singaporeans truly a community with a distinct identity in practice? Many are distanced and dislocated from their own culture, if not totally deracinated. I'm sure that such questioning about cultural loss and cultural change is not confined to our Tamil community. I'm sure it touches on our Malay and our Chinese and our Chinese educated, especially community. And yet, look and read this sentence at the end of this narrative. We cannot be ourselves as we do not know ourselves. And to not know ourselves is not to know others. As a people, we will become dark, silent ships passing each other in the night. And this community, this organization has made a stand. This must not come to pass. In the same vein, Singapore has been positioning itself as a hub for trade, finance, education, and the arts. However, this ambition must be matched by intellectual depth, artistic vitality, and strong cultural and intellectual capabilities in interacting and exchanging with diverse peoples within and beyond our shores. The metaphor of a hub suggests spokes that reach out towards many directions. But to do so, the center must not be empty. The center must be a crucible of creativity. At the intersection of civilizations and contrasting paths to becoming and being modern, and some of these paths are really painful, we can contribute to building a sense of shared humanity with many peoples and with the arts playing a pivotal role. And on this note, I'd like to say that the University of the Arts is committed to collaborating with our arts educators across tertiary institutions as well as those teaching at pre-university levels. We are located at the heart of an arts and educational precinct in the city. Think of the tremendous intellectual capital and creative talent concentrated within a few square kilometers. We have yet to fulfill the potential of this precious ecosystem, seeking partnerships within the city and beyond, reaching out to the rest of Singapore and the region and the world. I will depart from my script here. Some of you know that it's been said that NAFA and LaSalle are both connected and separated by Middle Road. <laughs> and the hard-working Vice-Chancellor has made it his point, made it a point to walk up and down Middle Road <laughs> and across. And I can tell you, the traffic lights take a long time. <laughs> but many fascinating conversations 
with our LaSalle and NAFA colleagues and between them are happening in lecture halls, in seminar rooms, in the studios, in the galleries, and on street corners. Since the establishment of the UAS, we are gratified that national institutions in the cultural sector have come forth to offer support and collaboration. For example, the National Library Board has announced plans to centralize and consolidate its arts collections and programming in the downtown arts and educational precinct. This certainly presents a golden opportunity for UAS to work closely with the National Library Board and many partners in jointly reaching out to students, practitioners, researchers, and members of the public who love the arts. We also find great affinity with the National Gallery of Singapore and its new initiatives in designing and delivering online courses on art, drawing from its Southeast Asian collections, networks, and expertise. In addition, the gallery's major scholarly project in gathering and translating art writings of the region, which I've spoken about, engenders many possibilities for collaboration in the areas of teaching, research, and public education. And it's not just the UAS, NUS, NTU. All our art schools would be very keen to see where we take it from here. In the area of talent development, National Arts Council and the UAS will be launching the NAC UAS Arts Scholarship soon, in time for our first undergraduate intake in August 2024. This is in addition to NAC's initiatives in the areas such as research and public education. We would like to express our thanks for this clear demonstration of support for our educational mission. Now, staying on this little map of the city, it by no means excludes any institution, any arts educators, any colleague a little further away. Remember, we have MRT stations all over. Please come, and we would like to also come to you. And now, as I conclude, you would have sensed that throughout my sharing, I've touched on a series of apparently competing demands, and I've attempted to show that they are complementary concerns that we have to grapple with in arts education. I summarize them here. Livelihood and vocation, these are not binaries. They are not polar opposites. We want our graduates and, and our youth to make a living and to possess employable skills, to weather the major changes in professions, industries, and markets in the decades to come, and there will be upheavals to come. But they can't do this without finding and sustaining personal meaning and social purpose in the creative work that they do over a lifetime. We need to cultivate our inner selves, our inner strengths, de developing insight and maturity. And maturity does not equate with chronological age. At the same time, there are practical concerns. There are social conditions. We have seen this in the 60s, in the 70s, and certainly as we move into the new decades before us. 
how can we find opportunities to help our youth overcome such constraints and to enable professional growth. And sometimes it comes down to just one conversation between a teacher and a student. Beauty in the world, and I quote from Wilczek, the Nobel Prize theoretical physicist, and also squalor, suffering and strife. There is such great beauty embodied in the universe. And why are we blind to it? In nature and in human life. The telescope, the space telescope, looks into this ever-expanding space. Our microscope looks into this most terrifying virus called COVID-19. And yet, if you are a scientist, you will appreciate its beauty. Its terrifying consequences are not necessarily intended by it. It has been exacerbated by human action. And this leads to us also at the same time confronting ethical, social, and environmental challenges of our time. Next, craft and conceptual thinking. Our students must acquire disciplinary knowledge and specialized skills and must be constantly experimenting and encouraged to experiment with new materials and techniques. At the same time, this is not divorced from the deepening conceptual thinking cultivating a sense of history, a sense of the past, and critical judgment, including moral judgment, and bridging the arts, humanities, the social sciences, and the natural sciences. Just because the UAS is a university wholly dedicated to the arts, by no means does this mean that we do not take interest and be curious about all other disciplines, exercising and expressing human creativity through deep reading, feeling, seeing, listening, and performing. We are teaching generations of students who grew up skimming, scanning, on their electronic devices. Except for a minority, deep reading, a book from cover to cover, and what this does to the reading brain is something that we have to think about. In addition, deep seeing, looking, listening, performing, and of course, these questions come to the fore with generative AI. I'll, part, I'll, I'll, I'll depart from my script to say that there are days when I feel that I want to stand on the soapbox and tell our students, no more shortcuts. Take the long and winding road with turning points, dead ends, difficult contours, and perhaps you may meet some strangers who may, in that little conversation, change your life. Exploring and leveraging the creative possibilities of new technologies and valuing intellectual and artistic integrity Six, intimate self-knowledge and at the same time, deep understanding of Southeast Asia and the world. We are not nativists. We are not xenophobic. But just as with our 
artistic work, there are no shortcuts to understanding someone or some other culture, some other society so different from ours. Knowing ourselves intimately as diverse communities rooted in civilizations, and it's not just individual civilizations in boxes or in, in ethnic boxes or religious boxes. We have always had to reach out to each other. Civilizations have never been bubbles which are hermetically sealed and cannot be penetrated. Without inter-civilizational dialogue, we would not have the rich and complex human environments that we appreciate today. Knowing ourselves as diverse communities rooted in civilizations and as a nation located in modern Southeast Asia, understanding our neighbors deeply, their artistic and social struggles, and reaching out to the world with humility and self-respect. Seven and last, each of our institutions, we have every interest to strengthen our foundations, our resources, our networks, and to strengthen our sense of identity and belonging. This is especially true for our colleges, who are deeply and justifiably proud to belong to La Salle, to belong to NAFA. But together, as La Salle and NAFA, we must belong to a larger community. And beyond us, collaborating fruitfully with all our partners in arts, practice, pedagogy, and research across disciplines, schools, sectors, and countries. The work of transforming arts education is a collective mission with each of us playing a special role within and across our institutions in partnership with each other and our stakeholders and supporters. And we are so blessed that many individuals and not just institutions are here today and they have already entered into discussions with us, including for private philanthropy, as to how they can support our work and our students. We are not ready to announce such initiatives, and we will take our time to steward such goodwill and good faith in us. Collectively, we will pursue these priorities with purpose and patience with resourcefulness and initiative, with care and attention, bearing in mind the people who make our work possible, and especially those who do not enjoy the privileges of our profession, and whose lives we can enrich through our vocation. Fellow teachers and all our co-educators, we are living in the face of technological acceleration where speed and efficiency are prized. But we also have to contend with the plurality of values, values that can't talk to each other, that are incommensurable. This requires us to develop and exercise good judgment and discernment in making difficult choices. This, after all, is a hallmark of art making and arts education involving deep preparation, going through a process that has integrity rather than delivering a product in the most expedient way. This is why we have studio practice 
we have rehearsals, we have discussions. As arts educators and with our peers everywhere, we must take time, make time, give time to discuss, to debate, to deliberate, so that we can better respond to the demands of our time. On behalf of my UAS colleagues, allow me to end by borrowing from the words of our APAT colleagues who have given me permission to use these words. Sachita Manchipta, together we create. Thank you very much.